Good, mor good morning, everyone. I'm glad to introduce our first speaker of the day, uh, Mauricio Rocha from Brazil, and he's going to speak about um, why UX is not about the user. Thank you. Hello, guys. Thanks for coming today. So the campus party, right? Beautiful place. Engineering, um, coding, design, photography, user experience. Uh, brilliant place. My name is Maurice Rocha, and I work at Capgemini. Capgemini is a very large organization, 120,000 people over 40 countries. It's one of the biggest consulting, technology, and outsourced companies in the world. Before that, I work in large and small organizations such as Sapiens, Animal, Blue Square, and Vizar. And by the way, the lady already told I'm Brazilian, so nobody's perfect. So somebody has to be. So today I'm going to talk about user experience is not always about the user, right? Of course it isn't. But I hope by the end of my talk today, you're actually going to agree with me on that. So I'd like to talk about, start to talk about the process we go through in building an application. An application could be a website, could be a tablet, app, or a phone, or a TV, where you wave your hands these days. Anything you have to build, that's software. So you go through the discovery phase, definition phase, solving, design, I think it's design, uh, look and feel, yeah. uh, coding, and then testing. So that's a very simplified process, but that's roughly what we go through. And right in the middle you have the user, right? I hope you take, took into account the user, because if you didn't, then they're not going to use your app. And all your efforts will go down the drain. So let's look into detail. Discovery. You go to the business and you find out what's going on and what they want to build, whether they have an existing app or not, and about their users, that kind of thing. Then you find out about their users. Who are they? And again, if they have an application, try to find out a bit more about the users. Then you go to the definition stage. User profile. Very important. So who are the users? What do they like doing on the weekend? Do they have disposable income? Uh, are they tech savvy? What's their demographic? That kind of stuff. And then user journeys. User journeys are very, very important. Now I'll give you an example. If you are on a travel site, let's say me, I've got a family, I want to find a holiday place in the sun. I go straight to the search box, and then I type uh, family holiday in the sun. Hopefully I get some results and I might be interested in. That's one journey. Another journey might be, I'm a single uh, guy and I know what I want to do, so I go to, uh, maybe I'm looking for a, a stag party, and you happen to have on a top level menu there, a stag enhanced party, so I drill down, go through the menu structure until I find, hopefully, something I'm interested in. So that's very important. And then obviously information architecture. Once you've been through the discovery phase, you start thinking how you're going to group information together, Maybe how the menu is going to work in a few pages, that kind of thing. Next one you're going to solve, and that's wireframing. So wireframing is really a visual or a graphical representation on how the user interface is going to be like. So perhaps you're going to think about what the search box is going to be, and maybe what the menu is going to be, and the structure, and all the landing pages, the marketing pages, the sign up, all that kind of thing. Then you go into the user interface, which is kind of the same with the wireframe. But for me, it's like the wireframe with color. So if you take, for example, you take, for example, uh, an architect, and you hire an architect to actually build your house, design your house. Obviously, you kind of want some color there, so it helps you visualize the system, what you're trying to do. And I think that's important, because clients, they like to visualize the system, how the system's going to be like. So I think that's very important. And then interaction design is another one. So today we have many devices. If you have a phone, interact with your finger, tablet with your finger, again, smart TVs maybe, you wave your hand, and perhaps on the web you use a, you know, the pointing device. So you have to leverage the interaction. You know, what's the device um, provides that the interaction means for the user to actually operate your interface. Then we go into look and feel, support UI functions. So for example, if you have a site or like accounting software and you just say, look, sign up and no credit card required, have a big button right in the middle of the page. 
you probably want that button not to be gray, and maybe have orange or something like high contrast. So it needs to support the order of prominence on the page. And that's what I mean by this. Branding, of course, is your company is well known. People know about it. Then you obviously want to tap into the heritage because it provides trustworthiness. And attractiveness, well, I think we like to play with beautiful things, right? So if your app looks beautiful, the users are more likely to try, you know, to play with it and try harder. So I think that's very important. So code, you know, all your code ninjas there, you know, you actually build the app, right? And then you try to break it and maybe set it on fire. So before I go ahead, I'd like to know who's out there. Who are you? What do you guys do? Just have a feeling of the audience. Any user experience professionals around? I got one guy. Wow, very good. Uh, visual designers? Right. You guys do a bit of UX as well? Okay. It's kind of a natural progression, I think. It can be. Um, developers? More visual designers than developers in a geek conference. Wow, you guys winning. You know, visuals are, are all the rage. What about marketing? One marketing, two marketing. Very good. Okay. So, this is the simplified process we go through to build an application. And that's the summary we've just been through. So how many people think that discovery phase is part of the user experience profession and it's within the, the, the user experience domain? I think everyone agrees, right? The defined stage, yeah. Solving, wireframes, UI, still UX? No, yes, maybe. That's good, I think as we move to the right, more people will disagree with me. But that's good, that's exactly, I think, where we wanna be. Looking Phil, visual designers, are you guys part of the user experience? Yes, maybe, okay. Coders, are you guys part of the user experience? No? Absolutely not, nobody says a word. Okay, I'll try to change that, and obviously testing not quite there, it's just a validation. If I change those uh, summaries to one word each, what, story, design, making it attractive, making it efficient and validate. I think that begins to paint a picture that all of you guys actually are part of the user experience. If you build a system that's not efficient, the user experience will go down. If you build a system that's not attractive, well, okay, it might be functional, but it's nicer to be attractive. And if you don't tell a good story, then it's boring. So I'm gonna concentrate on the three most controversial ones. It's the solving, the, the wireframing side of things, the looking feel, and the coding. So in this first scenario, let's think of uh, an application or a device or a piece of hardware that has been sold properly. It has a great looking feel, but the code isn't quite there. It kind of works, but it's not really efficient. So when was the last time you bought something look, uh, look great, but it was slow to operate? Well, I actually did. I bought this DVR. Some seven, eight years ago. And it kind of looked great, it's a good brand, and I like the menus, you know, it operates really well. But it takes 20 seconds to boot. Imagine it's day and age, I want to start my DVR, I press the power button, it takes 20 seconds, right? Far too long, I don't use it anymore. It's actually there, because you know, we use iPlay and the rest of it. So it's a good example if you like, you know, the efficiency isn't there. Even though if everything else is, the efficiency isn't there. So it's a bad user experience. So that's an application I guess everyone knows about. It's a big social network. And for me at least, it's become very sluggish the last six months. I have an iPhone 4, so it's not the latest gadget. I guess everyone has a number five here, I guess. No, but I have a four, and I still think it's a pretty good hardware. But still, it's very sluggish. And there's some really clever stuff there lately and a few new widgets. I don't know if they're making more database calls. I just don't know, but it's just luggage. And I'm using less and less. So I think what we can take from this is we don't like to wait, right? Nobody does. Even in the UK, uh, people say, you know, we like to queue. I think we like to queue because we like the order of things. But the fact to, you know, waiting, we just don't like. 
And that behavior does not change when we use software. It just doesn't. We just don't like to wait. It has to be responsive. It has to be you know, not sluggish. It just has to flow really well. So the next scenario is when you solve the problem well, the code is efficient, but it just doesn't look that great. So the look and feel isn't really there. So when was the last time you guys bought something ugly? Probably never, right? Maybe, maybe, just maybe, you bought a present to your boss birthday party. That's probably the only time you probably did it. And I actually came across this little kit you might be interested in if you need some ideas. And I would keep him busy for about two years. And probably the end result will probably be a bit rubbish anyway. But moving on, so when was the last time you bought something beautiful? Yesterday, today, every day? You know, we just like beautiful things. But how about the last time you bought something beautiful and useless? I'm pretty sure if you go back to your, you know, your house, the flat, and look around the living room, you find some pieces of things you actually like. They look beautiful, but they just don't have a purpose. And maybe over time you think, oh, why did I buy this? So maybe an example is this teapot. You know, it's got a handle on the other side. It kind of renders the teapot useless. But I think it's kind of cool, you know, I like the color. It's something I put in my living room, my mates would come to visit me and say, well, that's what, it's a bit weird, but it's kind of cool, it's different. It's weird, but it's different. And even if you don't like this example, I'm sure you can think of examples where you bought beautiful things, but useless. So that's, that's the point there. So what we can take away from, from this is users try harder when it's beautiful. And you want to be in that position. You want to make sure your application looks great. You know, when you, you know, how many times you tried an application, it looks very beautiful. It's actually hard to use. But you kind of think, well, it's probably me, because it, it looks so cool. It can't be the application. You know? So the last one is when you, the look and feel is great, when the code is great, but you know, haven't solved the problem really well. It's just hard to use. So last time, oh sorry, last time you used something and you wish was easy to use. And I love remote controls. I don't know about you guys, I really love remote controls. It just, maybe barring the Apple one, it's just really hard and it's just all the buttons are the same size as if you, know, you need them all at the same time. When in fact, you need mostly the play button. And then the manufacturer went there, so oh, actually, let me color in a different color. That might help you to find the button you need to click. And on the left-hand side is the latest offering from a company now, and it's kind of cool, you know, there's fewer buttons, different sizes, you can, you know, tap into it and scroll, but still the play button is very tiny right at the top. And obviously on the right-hand side is the Apple offering, very, very simple. This is a, actually a flash site from a very well-known car manufacturer, and it's beautiful. You know, there's got a lot of 3D stuff and things flying around, really well crafted, very efficient, it works really well. I tried on a small lap, uh, an old laptop I have, but it's just hard to use. Look at the menu there, it's got a whole bunch of numbers. That doesn't tell me anything. What is it? So I had to hover my mouse over each of, each of these to find out whether there's anything that I'm actually interested in to see. So the website relies on me to make actions to find out whether they have something I like. So it's not really there. And the last one, this is a home banking application. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I use home banking, I want to log into my account, I want to check my balance, and maybe pay a few bills. That's all I want to do. I don't want to check ATMs. You know, they're everywhere. I don't want to just a branch. You know, I've, I've used online stuff. So. The screen real estate devoted for the task I do 99% of the time. It's probably about 20% to 15%. Granted, it's at the top, it's got a different color, but still I think you know, the, 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 the screen real estate for, for what I do most is just not there. So what we can take away from this is, you know, people don't care about your business, and sh so they shouldn't. And it's down to you to make them make it easy for them to do business with you. And that brings me to the new UX domain. So I think I've been through the whole um, application um, process and tried to paint a picture as to why it belongs to UX. So again, discover, define, solve, look and feel and code. I think that's where we want to be at. On the left hand side, you have research and definition. And yes, there is a place for research houses where they go and interview users. They might go abroad and you know, 
uh, find out about demographics, user behavior, and they come back and give you a very big and fat report. That's fine, it needs to be there. But if you are on the right hand side, on the design stage, on the look and feel, or code, you need to overlap. And that's the key message I want to get across today. Overlapping is key. And for that to happen, I think we need a neat set of skills. You need to overlap. So if you do, say for the designers in the audience, if you do design, you need to understand a bit of code. You don't need to be a coder. It would be great if you understand a bit more, but just, just, know, just know your constraints. Just know what's possible. Know what the programmers go through and what, you know, what the challenges they face. Not only you gain some respect, but also knowing your constraints, you will design better solutions. Yes, or, or have this person next to you, but still, you know, it pays off if you know a little bit. So overlap is key. And the same for the coder. Sometimes the coder says, no, we're gonna do, uh, that's how we're gonna go through this, and you know, I don't know, we have this something out of the box. So it's, it's important for the coder to understand why the user experience profession is doing what it's doing to serve the user. So all together in a team, working towards one solution. And you can think of it maybe like a fridge or a car engine. You know, all these systems, they all designed to work together. I can't see why software has to be any different. You know, all these multiple parts, if they work hand in hand together, then you can provide a good user experience. Again, it's not efficient, sluggish, bad user experience. It looks bad, bad user experience. We like beautiful things, yeah? Hard to use, bad user experience. I have no time to waste trying to learn your application. So if you work all together in a team, you want to work in Agile. And that, that, this, this speak is not about Agile. But the reason I put uh, Felix the cat there, because Felix is not the fastest animal on the planet, but he's very Agile. He can turn right, he can turn left very quickly, up and down. So if you work in a team together towards the same goal, you must be able to adapt and change very quickly directions. You know, don't try to predict thing what, you know, how the system is going to be like in three months' time. Oh, yes, yeah, so we're going to build all these features, and in three, four months' time, that's what we're going to build. The fact is, probably you won't, because things would have changed, and then you, 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 you're having feedback from the user, maybe found out the database is some legacy database, and your you great search box is not going to work anymore, because, wow, you returned really bad results. So just, just find things out as you go along. So in the new UX capability, we now have the what. We have to define. We have to design. We have to make it attractive. And we have to make it efficient. That's the coder. That's the visual designer. That's the researchers. Oh, sorry, that's the visual designer. That's the UX. So you guys are overlapping towards one same goal. This capability actually will give you full control of the user experience. And this is not about the UX guy say, hey, I'll tell the coder what to do, or I'll tell the visual designer what to do. It is about you understanding a bit of what the coder does. And it's about the coder understanding what you, know, what you do. And understanding that only working together from day one and having the overlap, you will be able to provide and actually design the best possible user experience. And if you actually are, you know, if you are at that point, there are three things I think you can look at. They're actually hard things to do. Uh, it's hard to define, but it's something for the future. One is micro experiences. So an example is if you, um, if you buy something on a site and you add to the shopping cart, and let's say the product jumps out of the page and it just land on the, on the shopping cart. That's kind of cool, you know, yes, it's animation, but it's, it's, it was done to inform you that you actually the, the product went to the shopping cart. It's just a nice little experience, like short bursts of nice experience uh, there to, to inform. The next one up is visceral design, and that's probably the hardest one. Game developers and movie, movie uh, directors are very, very good on that. And it's about ups and downs and rewards. So if a movie was actually very fun all the time and everybody was happy, it would probably be boring, right? You want, you want probably a really bad patch and really you know, something maybe, I don't know, uh, difficult, hard, violent, whatever it is. And then you have patches of really good moments and bad moments. That's what makes you feel, you know, it touches your emotions. 
and on the game perhaps. So if you play Mario Bros, or my kids play all the time, you know, they try very hard, you know, stage one, and for weeks they can't go through the stage one. But if they manage to succeed, maybe the screen will play some different music or, you know, all the, uh, uh, the stars will fly around the screen. So that's reward. That's acknowledging, yes, you've made it. But by the way, we're going to go back to the, you know, the hardship again. You have to try again. So obviously, don't make it difficult for people to buy stuff on, on, you know, if you're selling a product. But, you know, uh, again, on, on a travel site, and it, you, you probably, uh, it's, um, what can I say? It's probably a hard process. You have to select many things. And if you're going abroad, you have to, you know, check your, you know, seats and credit card. So maybe at the end, you might say something like, oh, thank you very much. We're donating one pound out of your, our own pocket to charity. And it's not going to set the, 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 the world on fire, but it's kind of nice. You've been through a really kind of hard process. And you say, oh, that's nice. They're, they're giving one pound to, to charity. And the other one is humanized systems. And that's one that I really, really like. A good example is Apple's iCloud. I'm sure you guys have seen it when you try to log in. And if you get it wrong, the little widget just wiggles on the screen. I think that's really nice. But what it's doing is it's not saying, oh, you got it wrong, or please try again. They used animation to, to communicate that so you have to try again. But it gives you a feeling that the interface is alive. It's trying to communicate it on a different level. Not on a boring error message level, but you know, so, oh, this is cool. And that, that creates an emotional response where people begin to relate to your application, not as a cold and dull piece of software, but maybe something that's a bit alive and it looks great and it's nice to use, that kind of thing. So if you do all of that and you, you, know, you, you are on a small team, work towards the same goal, then you're ready to design everywhere. And these days, as you know, we have devices everywhere, different interaction models, different screen real estate, different capabilities, different processors, bandwidth, you name it. So only working together, you can make it. And that's the one thing I would like you guys to take away today. You have to overlap, push yourself out of your comfort zone, learn a little bit more about what the other guy is doing. He would do the same. You overlap, you build the solution together. That way is the only way, in my view, you can build the best possible user experience. Thank you very much. So I think we're going to have some time for questions. Yeah? I'm a slightly earlier, but that's good. You guys can ask many questions if you want. Be as you know, controversial as you can. Let's get some dialogue going. Any points you agree, disagree, like, don't like? I think you need some mic there. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering how difficult would you say that is to give the user-friendly experience when you add uh, more complexity to a, a software or an app or something like so that. So can you repeat the question? So, mm, so yeah. how difficult would you say that is to give the user-friendly experience yeah. when you add more complexity to the to a software or an app, more functions, and, you know. Right. Well, I, I think, you know, if, if you do a small system or a large system, I think everything should be broken down into components. And if you've done the user experience process properly, you would have found out, for example, the things you need to address. It needs to have search. It needs to that way to people to buy things. It needs to have means for people to subscribe. It needs to have means for people to maybe to interact. There's some social networking. So that's, that's, these things are not really related to the system at this stage. It's just the things that need to be there. And if you've done there, then you go from there and try to build your components. So I think you can break down things into components. And I work from there. But that's why, uh, for example, code efficiencies are important. If you started from day one and you code it really well, you thought about scalability. You thought about, you know, if this doubles in size, if we need to add more features, you just build for that. So again, you know, you need to work together. And all these guys have to think, you know, I, I'm not actually coding this because I'm trying to reduce the latency between the database and the client. I'm doing so because that will provide the best user experience. And regarding the, the IPP of your bank that you show, the bank IPP, um, would you say that it's, it's not always good to show 
the user all the possibilities that the software has? Well, I don't think so. Uh, so I'll give you an idea. If I had, if I had 10 perfumes here on stage, and I ask you, can you pick one you like? So you're gonna try a few and probably, you know, so I don't know, maybe I like the first one, the second one, the third one. If I give you only three, that would be an easier choice. And if you pick the third one, I say, oh, by the way, now I have five more that are very similar to the third one. That will help you go through in your decision making. So sometimes, yes, but I think too much choice is really hard. Apple, very good example. We have the iPad, the iPhone, the Mac, and, uh, and that's, I think, the Mac, uh, well, three or four categories. And once you go there, then, okay, you have a few, uh, more, a few more options, and then once you select a, a piece of hardware, then you can further customize. But they take you on a journey, they make it easy. So you could maybe on that app, you could say log into your account or maybe other options. And then if you tap onto that, then you have the other options. Because, well, I think 99% of the time you want to use your banking app to log into your account, right? So it's about finding out, again, it's about user research and doing testing and finding out what, why people come and use your app and design for that. If you give more options, they're not addressing what they mostly like to do, it's noise for me. And it would just distract them from doing what you want them to do. Thank you. Hi. Um, which do you think is the most important factor in creating good, a good user experience out of the sort of six stages? I think they're all important. No, no. I think you ask me, it's a tricky question. You're probably asking me, if I can take one out, which would that be? Or maybe you can rephrase this to say, if I could concentrate more on one, if which one would that be? Split the time between the, between the six. Split the time? Yeah. Oh, it's, it, it's, I can't really answer that. It depends on what you're trying to build. It depends how big the application is. It depends what the application is trying to do. So it's really, really difficult. Um, Even during projects, when you actually define things and you, you know, start working in a team, as you go through, you discover things like legacy systems or budget changes, that, that kind of stuff. So it's, it, I, I still believe overlapping and working together is key. It's about a mindset. Again, there's a cog, there's an engine on a car. You take a cog out and it just doesn't really work. Yeah? And that's a, a lot of the places I've been, this is very a sequential work. There's no overlap. And, and maybe the developer will say, oh, you know, this, you know, if I build this, it's going to be really hard. It's going to take me twice as long. If we change that a little bit more, then I'll, you know, I'll be able to make it in half of the time. So that's why working together is one solution is the best. So I, I, I can't say which one. I think they're all important. Yeah. Okay, hello, Peter, Czech Republic. Uh, I would like to ask you about if you think that it can be one-man show Oops. in yeah. all of these six sections. And the product can be great on the... Um, yeah. Uh, I, work, I worked in two startups. Where it was pretty much, was, that was the setup. It was good, it was fun. I learned a lot. But I, I really wish I had more people that worked with me. Because when you are a one-man show, you have to cut corners. Uh, and when you cut corners, you know, these experience again begins to suffer. And then, then again, you spread yourself too thin, right? Unless you like the, the, the new Einstein or something like that, or the Steve Jobs. And chances are you're probably very good at one or do two of these things, and then the others you kind of know well, or you can you know, maybe research, you kind of get up to speed and you do it. And I think there's a place for that. And everybody, I think everybody, like everybody out here, that if you could work as a one-man show, even for six months, I, w I would advise you to do so. Because that, you know, you're going to put yourself in a position to deliver. If you don't know how to code, well, we've got to find out. You know, if, you, you know, if you, your first design looks bad, well, you're going to try over the weekend. Because your boss felt you know, everything was to be ready on Monday. And you're nowhere near there. So you just have to be, you know, you have to be trying until you do it. So I think that's a very good position to be in. However, it's very, very hard. Because uh, you can't be an expert in all of these things. But it can be done. Yeah. I think that it can be done if you have a very good feedback or somebody who will mentor you and help you and say that it's a good way or wrong way. And after it, it can be one-man show. 
Yes, well, one, one of the things, if you're a one-man show, one of the things you have is agility, lots of it, because you prioritize what you can do, you know what the, where you are in the development stage, and you know the stakeholders, and that's a really big plus. And normally you don't have to go through several layers of management to do that. But having said that, you know, every company, including Clap Jim and I now, even being a very large organization, we work in agile teams. So we have this mentality about user experience, you know, we create teams and we're very agile, we move direction, so we adapt as we go along. Uh, so, but having said that, I think agile is the, the best thing you have on your side. Yeah. It can be done, don't take me wrong. You know, it's really, I, I, I love the time when I worked in the startups where you really have to make things happen 10, 12 hours a day. I, I've been on, on, on Thursdays where we have deployment at I think 11 o'clock in the evening. And my boss had this rave music. And I said, dude, this is crazy. So, well, but it's after 10. We need some music. But, you know, I've learned a lot. Uh, but, you know, I like to be part of the bigger team now. Because, obviously, I learn from the other people as well. And they learn from me. And we're all, again, we grow as a team and we move up together. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Any question about football, since I'm Brazilian here? Just a question, as we have a bit of time, do you think Brazil is going to win the World Cup next year? Yes? I hope so. I don't think so. But every time we're the underdogs, we kind of made it, didn't we? Let's see. OK. If you don't have any more questions, again, guys, you know, push yourself outside your comfort zone. Learn something new. You don't need to be an expert. Even if you know, particularly, say, visual designers, even if you know what is possible, that's, that goes a long way. Knowing your constraints. Like when you build a house, your constraints is uh, you know, how big is your land and your budget. Like, you know, what, like when you go on holiday, is the time you have available to be away. You need to know your constraints. If you don't know your constraints, you suggest functionality and system that can't be built, or it's hard to build, or it's more expensive to build, or it doesn't integrate so well. And that's, that's the key message here, overlapping, pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming.